Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Professor Barry Rabe, the Ford School of Public Policy, and in particular, the International Policy Center, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our third webinar event for the North American Colloquium on Climate Policy. The North American Colloquium is an ongoing collaboration between the Ford School, the University of Toronto's Monk School, and the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México's Centro, uh, Center for North American Research. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of the Meany Family Foundation for making this year's programming possible. Today's event focuses on Mexican and Canadian perspectives on North American climate policy. We'll begin with an update from Andres Avila Ackerberg, Executive Director of Polea, a leading environmental organization in Mexico. Dr. Avila Ackerberg will discuss the current state of play in Mexico with regard to climate policy. We will then move to a conversation between professors Deborah Van Nijnenten and Marcela Lopez Vallejo, leading academic voices from Canada and Mexico, respectively. The discussion will be moderated by Alison Beattie, a recent Ford School PhD graduate. This will then be followed by a question from Professor Barry Rabe and then an open Q&A discussion. As audience members, you can submit a question at any time using the Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom control panel. Apologies in advance, we will not be able to get to every question, but I did wanna note that we have decided to extend the event until 5.15 local time to accommodate as many questions as possible with the understanding of course, that some of you may need to leave us sooner. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Andres Avila Ackerberg. Dr. Avila Ackerberg is the executive director of Polea and has over 20 years of experience developing and implementing policies and legislation through his work in government, civil society, and academia. He, has, he was previously the director of the Globe Mexico Forest Initiative, where he worked on comprehensive legislation to support sustainable forest management. More recently, he successfully coordinated 17 climate-related projects to support Mexico's implementation of its general law on climate change and the United Nations Framework for Climate Change's uh, nationally determined contributions. Dr. Avila Ackerberg holds a PhD in political science from UNAM and a master's in international relations from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Ackerberg. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, I will be sharing my screen. So please let me know if you can see it, just to be sure. Yes, you can see it. Yes, we can. At great, least. great. Okay, so let's start because we have just a few minutes. I was asked to give you a briefing on Mexico's climate policies, which is, you know, very broad, but I will try to do some sort of summary. And then we'll, I will concentrate on the subnational legislation, which is what we are doing and which we believe it's a very important tool right now for moving forward in terms of climate action. So maybe you know this, just go very fast. There is an emissions gap that we have a challenge worldwide. Current um, NDCs are not enough to, to achieve the goal of the um, Paris Agreement of uh, not going beyond the two degrees Celsius increase. We are going be uh, more than that. In, in, in this sense, Mexico is an important actor, is the third in place in the world in terms of emissions, and that accounts for approximately 1.3% of the total. Mexico presented its NDC on time before the, the entry into force of Paris Agreement. It was uh, established on 22% the goal to 2030 below its baseline under the base uh, business as usual scenario, no? just like a, a developing country that we are. And it could grow up to 36% if we have international support. Um, difficult to, to, to decide right now if this is going to be accomplished because it's early, but uh, some calculations have let us know that the we um, we need to, to to be a bit more ambitious in terms of going as you know a, a, a crucial contribution to the Paris Agreement target. We are in this trend towards a three degrees increase. So this is Mexico's inventory. I'm not going to stop. You, if you want to learn about it, you can just 
consulted, uh, this is uh, in the sixth national communication to the UNFCCC, just to highlight uh, two sectors, transport and energy are responsible for half of Mexico's emissions. And you see all the, the variants. This is the last, uh, the latest inventory 2015, 2015. So uh, what, what are our, our political tools to, to fight climate change? It is basically, let me say so before, Mexico has been a very active participant worldwide, historically, in terms of the UNFCCC. Uh, you know, we are, where we are a non-annex one country in, in that sense. We signed and ratified Kyoto Protocol, of course, because we didn't have any commitments <clears throat> as a developed country just to present national communications. We have presented six national communication, which is, I think, one of the countries which has presented the most. We present in our NDC, as mentioned, and we sign and ratify Paris Agreement. So we have been very active. Our challenge, of course, has been implementation. But in terms of national action, our basis for climate policy is our law, our general law on climate change, which was enacted in 2012. We were the first developing country in the world to have a climate legislation, the second uh, just um, after the UK. And it has been having reforms, the latest and very important was in 2018. So basically the political instruments we have, and we can present on each of them for, for many minutes, but I will just mention them. It's um, the, the strategy which sets, you know, the, 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 the horizon for the future work in terms of climate change, 10 years, the program, the special program, which every government in turn has to set one, and, and put the, the targets in, in a six year period. The inventory that I just uh, showed, the register and the climate change fund, you know, a financial instrument to support the implementation of our, these actions. And as mentioned, this latest uh, reform we had for the law included our NDC, which is very, very interesting because our Mexico, our law, our climate change law already puts the international commitment into a national commitment. Of course, it is, you know, mandatory. It is also subject to some conditionalities, but is this very, I think, very uh, important to, to mention. Uh, this is our NDC. Again, I won't stay too long, just to have a look. This you can consult it at the INEC, that's the Instituto Nacional de Ecología y Cambio Climático. This was the previous one, and it's just to, to see how are the different contributions from the eight sectors considering the inventory. Basically, it's the 22% target for 2030. And if there is some support, it will go up to 36%. No? And you can see here, just that um, to give you an idea of it. Um, and just recently, as many countries presented our, our most um, updated, our, our newest NDC, which you remember last year was supposed to be the year of ambition and it was had to be the, the COP in the UK, which didn't happen because of the international situation. But in the case of Mexico, our NDC that just started just to, to look at it because of this, this event, uh, it didn't go more than we already had uh, offered in terms of ambition, in terms of numbers the 22% remains the same in terms of uh, mitigation, but it does say that, uh, for example, energy efficiency wasn't into our actions. Now it is a very important tool to achieving this, uh, this target. Uh, it didn't have before, you know, the agenda 2030 SDGs. Now it has reference to many of them. And of course, adaptation. That's, I think, the most uh, important thing to highlight on this new NDC because adaptation is uh, much more uh, explained and, 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 and specified in terms of the different actions. So at the first glance, it doesn't seem to be an increase in ambition, but then again, it is early uh, to, to measure effectiveness. We will see that in a few years, hopefully. So this is also something that I always like to highlight in terms of uh, Cost benefit. You no, know, this is also information that I was able to to be involved some years ago. The cost of action versus the cost of inaction in Mexico. So, 
for 2030, if we do not, if we don't do anything, it will cost us 143 billion dollars. No, you know the, the the consequences of climate change. Implementing our NDC cost us 126 billion dollars. So just if you are not, uh, if you are a non-believer in climate change, if you see these numbers, that makes sense. No, because it's 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 less what you have to spend than what you will have to pay if you don't do nothing. Of course. The ones who have to incur in the in the in the expenditures are the ones who are already in government. The ones who be receiving the benefits not necessarily are those who are will be doing the expenditure. That's the political complication, no, in terms of timing. So, um, just to 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 finalize uh, what I was saying, this is a situation in Mexico that. Uh, Current uh, priorities are not very much uh, in line with, you know, pro to promote, for example, uh, renewable energy. There is a shift more towards uh, fossil fuels, uh, promoting more, you know, this idea of energy security, energy sovereignty. Just these days, some days ago, there's been a, a proposal to reform a law, which has been very controversial because it ends up, it ends uh, you know, free free competence in terms of the energy, no? So there is a lot of discussion right now in Mexico. That's why uh, while this takes place, uh, we are currently trying to, to support that uh, actions don't stop and, and, and maybe just uh, try to use the, the willingness of some uh, actors at the subnational level to keep um, doing some stuff and basically through legislation. So, uh, we already, we are an, an NGO called POLEA, Politica and Legislación Ambiental, which is a policy and environmental policy and legislation, uh, trying to, to support this international process uh, through updating legislation. Maybe 80% of Mexico states have already climate legislation, some still don't, but those who have it, it's a bit old. They already have five, eight years, and it is need some sort of update, basically in terms of, you know, the, the recent international processes, scientific, uh, scientific improvements and so on. We did already this with Mexico City, a very important actor in Mexico in terms of climate change. The law is still in the legislative process, it needs still to be voted. We are working right now in Oaxaca, a very different reality, you know, Oaxaca with lots of indigenous peoples and, and, and adaptation is a very vulnerable state. So priorities are different. And we will be working this year, 2021, with support from the UK PAC program uh, on Quintana Roo, Yucatan, the states you can see there, no? These are six states. Mexico City, if successful, we are doing one, one step forward. I mean, if, if approved the, the, the update of the legislation are next, challenge will be to harmonize other legislation with climate legislation, which, for example, transport legislation, waste legislation, to make some channel of communication with climate. Because sometimes you, you legislate differently and separately, and there is no communication between laws. Very interesting exercise that we will try to do. So this is not only you know, the technical work that we are doing. We are not just drafting the laws. We are also dealing with decision makers, which is always a challenge and very complicated, but we have done, I think, good things and we have experience there. And of course, trying to have an inclusive process and stakeholders to, to give us their opinions so we can have a, a relevant thing to, to present. So just finalizing, uh, you know, these are tough times, tough circumstances. Governments uh, under different parts of the world sometimes are very keen on climate change, sometimes they are not. But uh, I think uh, we need to do something, no? not only complaining, and I'm, that's precisely what we try to do with these sort of actions. Uh, in this situation, as I just mentioned, I think climate change actions, uh, either mitigation, adaptation, are very important for a green recovery that the world needs, and more specifically our countries. Um, I think the current country of Mexico is very congruent with the developing country position, you know, with this uh, principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. We are behaving like a developing country. We are waiting for others to take action 
and we are trying to concentrate on our priorities, which is poverty eradication and other social priorities. That's what I see in this current government. Uh, and I just to, to highlight and, and, and what I assume you will be talking just in a minute, uh, we do need your, your, your experiences from the US and Canada in terms of subnational action, because I, I know you have done this before. And of course, just to finalize and, and leave you there, uh, the changes in the US government are very, very at the perfect timing. And I hope this triggers lots of action in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andres. That was very, very informative. And uh, we really appreciate you sharing your unique perspective as the director of an NGO in Mexico. Uh, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce professors Van Nynenten and Lopez Vallejo and our discussion moderator, Dr. Allison Beattie. Dr. Van Nynenten is professor of political science and North American studies at Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada, where she is also on the faculty of the Balsley School of International Affairs and a research fellow at the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada. Her five books and more than 50 articles and book chapters have largely focused on the topic of transboundary environmental governance in North America at the US Canada, US Mexico and continental scales. Dr. Lopez Vallejo is professor in the Center of North American Studies at the Universidad de Guadalajara in Mexico. In addition to her academic career, she has worked in multiple Mexican government ministries. She has held a number of prestigious academic fellowships throughout the globe, and her numerous publications focus on North American regionalism, transnational governance, climate and energy policy, and the role of sub-state actors in carbon markets. Finally, Dr. Allison Beattie recently earned her PhD here at the University of Michigan, a dual PhD in public policy and political science. Her dissertation focused on uh, cross-national policy diffusion at the sub-national level, which fostered her ongoing interest in climate change and renewable energy policy at the sub-national level in all three countries. Uh, so Allison, uh, why don't you take it away? And we're looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, it is an honor to moderate today. Thank you everyone across not only the country, but the whole continent for joining us today. That's wonderful. And special thanks to Marcella and Deborah. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you here. So briefly, um, let me start by asking, how would you characterize the Canada US and also the Mexico US climate policy relationship to this point, first under President Obama, then under President Trump? Um, who did you want to start there, Allison? Do you want me to start? <laughs> Please, thank you. Okay, well, I would say that if we look across the expanse of time, uh, say from the 1990s further, um, I would say that the, the environmental policy relationship has been relatively low key, very focused on pragmatic avenues of cooperation and a real focus on uh, regulatory harmonization. And I think a good example here is the case of vehicle emission standards. Um, some really long running joint technology projects, carbon capture and storage is one of them, but really a lot of focus on issues relating to shared environmental resources. Uh, and I would say that the relationship has really been based in what we would call transgovernmental relationships. So really close working ties between offices in companion departments uh, across the two countries that work, you know, through issues outside of the political limelight. And I think really this has contributed to the resilience of the bilateral environmental relationship, even during periods of time when I would say our leaders have perhaps not been so enamored of one another. And I might use the examples there of Prime Minister Harper and President Obama, and then President Trump and Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, and I would also note that the relationship is very multi-level and Andres talked a little bit about that. We, we cannot just look at what is happening between the two governments at the national level because there are lots of environmental policy interactions between states and provinces, but also what I call diagonally between Canada and the individual U.S. states. Um, now, in terms of the climate policy relationship, I would say that it has not been particularly ambitious 
in terms of climate initiatives. And, you know, I would say that's probably by design. Um, there has not been until recently a full consensus in either country that climate change should be the priority in terms of domestic policy and in the bilateral relationship. You know, I think we did get a taste of more ambition with the meeting of the minds between President Obama and the then newly elected Prime Minister Trudeau. But all of these initiatives, I think without fail, were sidelined under the Trump administration and just disappeared. Um, but I would say at the present moment, overall, you've got two countries that are used to working together. They've got lots of really good mechanisms for getting stuff done together. And now they have a shared pur purpose, which you know I think is, is actually breathtaking in its scope and single-mindedness. Single I'm not sure I've ever seen this and certainly not uh, in the environmental relationship. So I think it's really an exciting time to be watching the Canada-US relationship. And I, and I want to thank, uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, at this time to take part in the discussions, because I think there's a lot of scope to think about new initiatives going forward. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation, Professor Barry Rave, uh, Professor Joshua Bachet, and Alison Bidi, thank you for for this uh, moderation, Andres, nice to see you. And, and I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Andres of, um, about how has the relationship been uh, throughout uh, the, the, the North American region uh, regarding climate change. Especially it has been, you know, turned like upside down because we had Obama with Calderon and Enrique Peña Nieto having this as quoting Deborah enamored <laughs> about climate change, maybe, maybe just in paper, because there were several um, um, federally led instruments, like diplomatic instruments, memorandum of, of understandings, frameworks, ta task forces, etc., cetera, um, which, which led to the same goals, maybe, you know, the, very slowly in terms of implementation. However, the goals were, were aligned, especially with our national law in 2012 and our energy reform in 2013, which, which, which included the uh, law for energy transition, right? And several instruments. So I guess with the Obama, Calderon and Peña Nieto relationship, things were going straightforward in terms of even harmonizing some standards for well, attempts to harmonize in terms of methane emissions or, be, or, or vehicles uh, standards. And it was, it, for me, it was very, very surprising uh, the, um, to see that 2016 leaders, North American Leaders Summit, you know, where the three, um, the three executives, Peña Nieto, Aman Trudeau, put all, all efforts into having a North American uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal to 50% to 2025. It was impressive. Of course, it was not achievable. <laughs> it was just ambition, but it was, it was a good message. However, all these um, all these good efforts led, were led by the subnational, the subnational efforts too. They were accompanied by those and even sometimes they were pushed forward by the, the local efforts, especially having you know these cross-border uh, relationships between the North the, the the U.S. Southern states with the Northern Mexican states. Just an example: the electricity integration between California and Baja California is so tight that Baja California, the Northern state in Mexico, is not even connected to the Mexican grid. It's connected to the California grid. And it's regulated by the Western, uh, the, the WEC, right? The, the Western Council of uh, Electricity. So, and, and the, the interaction between cross-border transmissions line, cross-border exports, imports in terms of renewables, um, it's very, it's very important. And, um, and, and another example would be uh, how the, um, Cali the, the California Quebec carbon market is, is going into a very important phase by, in, by including other 
others of national governments, and even signing uh, a memorandum of, of understanding with a new Mexican carbon market, the Mexico CO2, uh, in terms of having a cooperation uh, between a subnational, a subnational uh, initiative, transregional initiative, with a, with a with a federal government in Mexico. So you know maybe um, collaboration was was um, was going forward in in those administrations. And it was expected that in Mexico, as Andres uh, mentioned, we were taking the road to uh, towards developing renewable energy with the energy reform and with all, all instruments to implement the climate change law of 2012. Um, however, well, maybe we can talk about in the other segment about what happened, what, what changed in, in, in North America, especially in, in the, in the Mexico-US relationship between, um, especially between, with the change of, of, of both executives and with the also enamorment of both new executives, calling, calling it Trump and, and Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and aligning another, uh, uh, once again, their interests, but in the other, in the other sense. You both make an excellent point that when you characterize the US-Canada or US-Mexico relationship, there's so many levels. It's not just a federal, there's transnational, there's subnational, there's nonprofits, all of these different um, groups together creating the relationship. So along those lines, what would you say right now are the most salient political, economic, and policy dynamics in Canada and Mexico right now relating to climate change? And maybe we can go in reverse order this time. Okay, thank you, Alison. Well, you know, I don't want to take more uh, a lot of time um, scrutinizing the Mexican the Mexican uh, climate and, and energy policy because Andres has already talked about it. But I would like to to raise a point on this multi level approach that Alison and Deborah and, and Andres also brought to the discussion, which is. Of course, we have the federal government, the national, the subnational governments, but also the role of business in this, in, in this pushing forward certain agendas for climate change and or for renewable energy. You know, in Mexico with the energy reform, we had a lot of investment from renewable business from Canada and Mexico and from other parts of the world that were going, that were uh, starting to, to provide um, renewable energy, call it solar, call it, call it wind, um, in, the, in recent years. That's one part. But the other part, which is rarely touched uh, or talked about, is the consumers. Here in Mexico, because of NAFTA, of course, and, and now USMCA, we have a lot of uh, Canadian and, and US business here in Mexico, which are making the transition into renewables, into consuming renewables. Let's say General Motors or even Walmart here in Mexico. So there's, there's the, this push forward for the renewable sector in Mexico and for um, getting to, to, to comply with, the, with the certain goals in climate change that they're not, they're not only pushed forward by certain types of, of NGOs or by uh, certain governments or, or groups in society, but also by business. It is uh, now esteemed that it is the, it, it costs the same to rebuild a coal factory than to establish a wind park. So the choice is political, right? So it's not it's maybe ten years ago it was cost benefit, but now it is political. So mm -hmm. we, we and, and who is pushing forward this type of of, uh, of agenda? To align with global with global leaders in the market, well, their business is totally a business, and um, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> and um, well, that was a, a one point that I wanted to raise. And the other one is that deep integration in terms of energy that we have in in between Mexico and the United States in terms of natural gas and in terms of um, certain um, electricity um, exchanges in the border. So we cannot talk about 
climate goals, or climate cooperation, at least in Mexico, US, and, I know, and, and I'm sure in the Canada, US case also, without going into um, acknowledging how, how, how climate goals and climate policies are supported by energy policies. Excellent point. Um, you know, it's funny when I was thinking about this question, um, which originally when we talked about using this question, I thought, oh, this will be easy to answer, right? What's really going on in Canada right now? And, um, you know, in terms of thinking about if I were a policymaker, what am I worried about, right? Um, but it was harder than I thought. Um, so let me sketch out a few things, a few sort of observations on, on what I think uh, is interesting about the Canadian context right now. So of course, Canada faces many of the same challenges that the US does with the COVID-induced economic decline and the same with Mexico. Um, although I would say that we have used slightly different tools to address it. Uh, than the US has, and the political debate has taken on a different complexion. Um, the economic, uh, economic situation in Canada is what you would expect, right? Given the rolling restrictions and lockdowns, I'll highlight just a few things. High levels of unemployment, uh, a little comparison here in 2019, the unemployment rate was 5.67%. In 2020, uh, the national average was 9.25%. And of course, it fluctuated through the year and, and across regions. And some regions were very hard hit, uh, especially in the West. So big focus right now. Everything that a, that a pol politician talks about always lands on the word jobs. That's kind of the number one imperative. Uh, the impact on business and industrial activity has been immense, obviously. Um, a big in, impact on small and medium enterprises, which for Canada actually make up 98% of employer businesses, which is quite staggering. Um, you know, a lot of them lost revenue in the order of 40 to 50%, many of them unable to take on more debt, um, bankruptcies. And then of course you've got the big players like the fossil fuel industry, which, which is so critical to the economy of Western provinces and uh, in the Atlantic provinces as well, very hard hit as demand tanked. And this is number two on my, on my hit list, right? This is one of the top burning questions, surely on the cabinet agenda, I'm sure. What do we do about the fossil fuel provinces who are likely never going to recover from this and are sliding down a knife edge um, of structural transformation and the way that the global economy powers itself? So a really big uh, issue here. Canada has responded uh, really right from the beginning with a large suite of both individual social and income supports, um, but also um, sectoral support funds given out to, to different industries and, and to social and community groups. Lots of programs to encourage hiring, subsidies to encourage employers not to lay off their workers, additional support programs for caregivers, sick leave, mortgage deferrals, loans for a whole variety of uh, different kinds of businesses. And then layered on top of that were provincial uh, support programs. Now, I would say that these support programs, for the most part, uh, were supported uh, by the Canadian public and by the you know political class. There wasn't a huge debate about whether government should be stepping in in a serious way. Um, and I would think, though, that um, this may really uh, become the subject of debate over the coming year. OK, so if you if you think about taking the pulse of the Canadian public, I would say that COVID really highlighted the important role that the government has to play in steering society and the economy, particularly through really tough times. Um, now, there is a deeper reserve of support in Canada for active government intervention, I would say. But I think this crisis really showed that the Canadian public, what government can do in a really short amount of time. Um, I would also say at the same time that I think there's a good reserve of support in Canada for action on the climate crisis. But here's the rub. What we want to know is whether there's, you know, stable support for buying the Trudeau government's argument that the way out of the economic crisis that that everybody 
um, you know, has experienced and government support was supported, et cetera, et cetera. You know, does that transfer to government large scale support for a green transition, which is being proposed now? And I would say that an increasingly restful population, rest, restless population is, is going to want to see some action pretty fast. Um, again, there's a reserve of support for government actions on climate, but it won't last if, if the public can't see really tangible impacts. And then, of course, in Canada, we're having a, a very big debate about equity and diversity across all policy areas. And it is expected that the Canadian government's approach uh, in terms of the green transition will, uh, you know, really have that lens applied of equity and diversity. Um, so there's going to be, there's obviously some really huge files on the Canadian government's agenda. And I think the trick's going to be to really kind of uh, bring them together in a way that creates those tangible benefits really quickly. Wow. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, especially with respect to how the agenda, like what are the most promising avenues for climate policy cooperation with the United States, with the incoming Biden administration, with the Mexican government? Did you want me to go or Marcel? Yes, please. Sorry. Oh, so I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. Um, this was also really interesting to think about because I have been uh, focused on the Canada-US environmental relationship now for, you know, two and a half decades. And um, it, it has been very interesting um, because the, the approach that I took to thinking about what are the most promising avenues right now is that I've been looking for alignment between, I would say four factors, right? I wanna see if there's four factors in place um, in different arenas that, that I think would undergird really good cooperation. Those four factors are political commitment at the highest level, uh, established working relations uh, in the area, a supportive regulatory framework would be nice or plans to put one in place pretty quickly, uh, and relatively low or no technical barriers. And I, I kind of see those four factors as as a litmus test for cooperation. And then the, my, my second kind of um, uh, aspect of my approach is to look at clusters of action, because we know that um, in terms of climate policy, there are so many linkages across policy areas and so many interactions between programming. And we have to really pay attention to those interactions because you know, they, they have effects and sometimes unintended consequences. So I kind of uh, approach this in terms of thinking about green bilateralism cooperative clusters, all right? So the first cluster is really, I think, straightforward. And I, I think we would get that pretty quickly. I call it the electric uh, trifecta, right? Electric cars, electric batteries, electric infrastructure. And that's something that clearly very highest levels, uh, both the Biden and Trudeau administrations committed to all three of those. Um, there are very strong established working relations in vehicles more generally, um, on vehicle emissions standards setting, um, of course, on North American automobile manufacturing, um, you know, keeping in mind NAFTA's new domestic content requirements, right? All of these things, I think, fit into or really undergird nicely a ramp up of Canada-US cooperation uh, on the electric trifecta, right? Because there's even a supportive regulatory framework in place. Uh, in Canada, it's in place. In, in the US, it took a little hit under the Trump administration, but I think that can be ramped up pretty quickly. And, you know, the technical stuff's you know, we're, we're still working on some of this, including um, some really good battery technology, but, you know, we, we've got the, the fundamentals in place. So I think this is one thing that we can ramp up really quick. Um, the other thing I think that I would say is, is a really quick startup is working on what I call the wicked three pollutants, right? And, and that's methane, black carbon, and hydrofluorocarbons. And all three governments have, ma have made commitments. Um, they actually started working on these 
uh, before the Trump administration came in, and that was the three countries we're going to talk about methane and black carbon. Um, Canada has a methane regulatory framework that has been in place, but its implementation has been delayed largely because the Trump administration kind of sidelined that. So again, I think that's something where there's political commitment, established working relations programming that was in place that got sidelined um, and uh, a, a supportive framework in place. Again, some of the technical stuff, uh, replacements for HFCs, that's, that's harder. But, you know, we can work on that. Boosting of green tech. That's another thing, you know, sort of a cluster of activities that we can talk about. Um, you know, we have, as I said before, a really good basis on cap carbon capture and storage. Um, you know, the U.S. Department of Energy was working with Canada on a long term demonstration project, but both administrations want to really ramp that up and make it more easily applicable and low cost. Right. That's a, that's a no-brainer, I think. Um, and I think that what would be interesting here, um, one of the biggest problems that both countries have identified as a barrier to green tech is, is, is guaranteeing markets, right? Uptake. And I think there might be something that the Canadians and Americans can do together and Mexicans as well to say, you know, hit some large industry partners and get them to make some commitments to use these technologies so that you can guarantee markets, right? A place for um, the supportive uh, technology that you've been working on. Wow. Um, I think we also need to talk about green procurement. And one of the interesting things there is this is gonna be a sensitive issue, right? With Buy American uh, orientations. Uh, and I'm sure Canada is wringing its hands about you know, some of those discussions. But maybe a good way to address that actually is to talk about a good news story on green procurement, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about that. Um, another, uh, another cluster of activities that I'm still trying to work my brain around is in low carbon ag agriculture. And that is, is really an interesting group of possible um, projects like you know, carbon sink sequestrations in the farming community, um, even doing some carbon trading. You know, there's some discussions about that. You know, maybe there's some cross-border possibilities there. Biofuels, right? Both countries have been working on biofuels and, and trying to address this issue of, you know, how do we create biofuels, especially for the aviation industry, um, so that you've got big uptake uh, and some clean tech for the agricultural sector. And then finally, I would say another cluster is in regional climate resilience. And that's where we can talk about cooperating uh, in the Arctic on what I call the CES nexus. So climate, economy and security. Um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of commitments that both governments have very recently made. And I think uh, a real meeting of the minds there. Shared infrastructure on the border, on the coasts. There's a lot I think we could do there. Um, and I, you know, I was, I was kind of thinking that the commitment of both countries to a, a just transition uh, kind of fits in with this longer term climate resilience. How do we support those fossil fuel communities that are, are really uh, feeling the hit uh, from, you know, large structural adjustment in the energy sector? Um, so, uh, you know, some some clusters there and then a few just uh, thoughts on, you know, Canada and the U.S. do a lot of work in international forums in terms of aligning uh, their asks and in negotiating forums. And, you know, we can do more of that, especially now when the two governments seem to agree uh, on how to move forward. And finally, I would say I think it's important that Canada and the U.S. identify some strategic partners in the green tech race, because make no mistake, we're in a race, right? Uh, and Germany, I would put at the top of that list uh, for both countries, indeed for all three countries. I'm not a, a China expert, but I think Canada is going to have to re-engage with China in some way. Uh, and maybe green tech is the way to do it. And then uh, Mexico, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of 
throw this a little bit over to Marcella because I've been shaking my head watching some of the recent decisions uh, of the federal administration and thinking it's exactly the opposite of what the other two administrations have been focusing on. And I'm, and I'm trying to think about how we can engage because we have to engage. Um, and one of my thoughts there was maybe even legislative engagement, um, you know, that is, is, you know, focused on sort of building uh, networks for programming. I, I love that. I definitely agree. We would like to hear your thoughts. And I'm wondering also if Marcella, you can also wrap up for us by talking about possible avenues for Canada and Mexico cooperation as well. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I would, would like to, write, to raise three points. First, um, with the administration of Trump and, and Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, our, our president in Mexico, there were, I guess, and Andres mentioned it quite quite well, that there was this premise of uh, going for energy sovereignty and not energy security, right? And that is a problem when Biden comes to power, right? For Mexico, with this uh, with this administration in Mexico, because I don't know if you remember the the one of the debates between Trump and Biden, and and Trump pushed. Biden to, 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 to respond to a question on who, will you be able or will you be willing to um, confront the oil companies in Texas, right? Or the oil or the, the coal manufacturers, et cetera. And the, the, the answer at the end of the day of Biden was yes. So it was, I guess, politically, it was very tough to say it. And I guess that, that will bring some implementation problems in the US with all these executive orders and because well let's um, let's be clear that we, the energy relation with Mexico or the climate relation between Mexico and the US is not a priority uh, now in the in the US uh, in the US Mexico agenda we have migration security and other and other issues going on however uh, i guess in the in passing one year two years of biden we will be we will be seeing some very tough um, tough um, guidelines for Mexico to align back to pushing forward renewables and to and to raise ambition, especially because uh, Biden has said that uh, they he will organize another leader summit of the Americas uh, in joint collaboration with some uh, climate change decision makers and with the the conference of parties, etc. So, and the goal is to raise ambition as a region. So Mexico will need to align or to do something to um, to 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 push forward the the our nationally determined contribution. Because as Andres mentioned, we have not increased any ambition. We were we stayed the same as in as in Paris in 2015. So one point is Mexico needs to think on how to get out to escape this premise of energy sovereignty and to go back to a different concept of energy security, including renewables in the, in the energy matrix. Second, second thought is, um, I guess with Biden, we are going to see uh, a little bit more, more um, room for, for action at the subnational level because, well, no, no, I, I'm not sure if it's because of the United States, but for in, in the case of Mexico, we need that. We need some room for, for action to cooperate with some states in the United States and some provinces in Canada to, to create these uh, bilateral subnational agreements to push forward the, the agenda of climate change and renewables, just in case that the federal government cannot move the the, the policy that it's that it's uh, performing now. So, you know, one one very elegant solution for the Mexican federal government would be to to let the, the states do their thing, right? And cooperate with other states in the United States provinces or even with both uh, executive uh, governments, with both federal governments in Canada and in, in the United States. Um, and I say this because uh, I say this like, uh, this thing about the elegant solution because, as you all know, one of the main 
pro projects of the Mexican president and this administration is to rebuild and reconstruct uh, the, the refinery uh, sector in Mexico, the oil refining sector in Mexico, and to strengthen and let's say protect, get some protections to the both uh, companies, uh, state companies of uh, power and oil, Pemex and CFE. So if that if those are the projects, and, and that is very, you know, very measurable in terms of the national budget, you know, a lot of the budget were for those projects, for CFE, CFE for, for, for Pemex, for um, the refinery. So, you know, he, he, he would need to fulfill the, the commitments that, in, that he made in the campaign and in the first year of government. So the only solution would be to, to leave others do the, the renewable uh, push to, towards the North American alignment. And the, third, and the third point I want to raise is the USMCA. The USMCA is very important for Mexico uh, for different reasons and, and for different <laughs> approaches. However, it is the protection renewable energy has in Mexico. Because as you know, last year, the federal government uh, launched and drafted some, um, some laws and against re uh, re renewal, renewal provision of energy in the hands of private companies. And there were some, um, well, there were a lot of protests. There, were, there, there, there was even a letter for, from congressmen and from energy companies in the US addressed to, to the President Trump for him to address to the president Samlo in Mexico to stop that here in Mexico, right? All the auctions for reno for and for electricity, which were in general for uh, renewal projects, were are postponed or suspended. I don't I don't want to say cancelled. In my mind, I, I hope they're just postponed. <laughs> uh, so th there were some attempts to give strength to. Uh, to both uh, state companies, energy state companies, Pemex and CFE, through this legislation. However, the USMCA has several chapters on uh, non-discriminatory practices, on um, regulation, on uh, avoiding protection, uh, protectionism to foreign investment, etc. So, with the USMCA in place, well, it is expected that if Mexico doesn't uh, um, doesn't uh, take out or, or quit those legislations, we will be having panels, we will be having uh, problems with that. So I guess we have several protections uh, to, to try to align to, to Biden's agenda and the, the federal government may be able to, to, pull, it up, to pull it up because um, we have some mechanisms, so some cross-border issues, some already developed frameworks in, in the relationship, which will give a solution to, to, to the, 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 federal, the Mexican federal priorities. Thank you. Both of your answers outlined some significant obstacles, but also some significant opportunities uh, for collaboration, both with the United States and between Canada and Mexico. Thank you very much um, for both of you for being here. This has been an honor and I'm going to turn it back to Josh. Thank you so much, Allison, and uh, thank you, Deborah and Marcella. W what a fascinating set of uh, conversations and responses. Um, at, in a moment, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Professor Barry Rabe, who is going to kick off our Q&A session. But I, before I do so, I want to let our audience members know um, that you can feel free at any time, beginning right now, uh, at the bottom of your screen to click on the Q&A tab and to submit a question in writing, and we will do our best to cover those after um, Barry's after the responses to Barry's question. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to introduce Professor Barry Rabe. He's the J. Ira and Nikki Harris Family Professor of Public Policy and the Arthur Thurnau Professor of Environmental Policy here at the Ford School. Barry will welcome our panelists and kick off our Q&A. Barry? Thank you so much, Josh. And uh, thanks to you and Allison for your role in leading today's conversations. And a particular shout out and thanks to our Canadian and Mexican colleagues, it is just wonderful to have you with us. And so thank you for your role and the insights that you're sharing on behalf of the entire Ford School and University of Michigan community. 
I would like to order out dinner and filibuster and go long into the night, but I'm not going to do that. But I am struck by the fact that we've been talking about climate change for some time now. And there's been very little reference to the idea of putting a price on carbon emissions, either through a tax or a cap and trade system. Even though this is part of the national and continental and global conversation on climate policy for more than a quarter of a century. And if you think of the three nations, I'm always curious about sort of how differences do promote possibilities for coordination or possible conflict. And they may even link a bit, Marcella, to your question about trade issues. We're beginning to see, particularly outside the North American area, those governments that have established large carbon prices beginning to talk about linkages to trade and border adjustment processes, particularly the European Union, which has really doubled down on both forms of carbon pricing uh, on a continental as well as nation scale, moving in just a couple of years to using kind of trade adjustments on imports. If we look at the three nations very quickly, as I understand it, Mexico has a very modest carbon price, less than $5 a ton with some exemptions. The US has no price on carbon nationally and may well go through the entire Biden presidency and not add one. And yet, you know, when we go across to Canada, we see an extraordinary commitment of now moving to formally $50 a ton through established policy, but one well into triple digits that would put Canada into the role of a global leader in using this very tool. Given all the trade that takes place and all the mechanisms to think about trade adjustments, environmental side dimensions of this, how do we begin to reconcile those differences? And does the fact that the trinational approach to carbon pricing is so different in these three countries, does that further divide us and complicate the challenges of coming together? Or are there opportunities to begin to stitch this together short of all out trade wars and border adjustment challenges? Just some questions for you. Marcella, why don't you start? <laughs> okay, thank you, Barry. Um, yes, you know, carbon pricing is, it, it was in the agenda of the North American Leader Summit in 2016. And I was very glad to hear that. Well, it was just, you know, um, uh, good wishes, right? You know, like we, we will be doing this and this and this. And in the list was uh, putting a price on carbon in the, in the region. However, um, I guess, you know, in terms of, of regional pricing, we would need to have you know, the institutions to support it. And we only have, you know, we have a diversity in Canada of different uh, types and of taxes and, and cover markets. We have the North American, the, well, the WCI or the, the REGI, right, in the, in the Northeast, the two carbon local carbon markets or transnational carbon markets. And in Mexico, we have a national carbon market, which is starting right now, this, uh, this year after trials and exercises and whatever, right? So I guess we would need to, to first set the, con the institutional conditions to regulate, measure, especially measure uh, with, with similar methodologies, for example, um, how to deal with offsets in the region, mm -hmm. how to deal with, um, with leakage and all those you know, carbon market problems that if you don't, if you don't address them in the design, the, you know, it, 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 it won't work. You know, it, it, it would be a useless effort. That's my first point. And the second point is that I guess that um, although, although the USMCA has, you know, certain protections, certain regulatory protections for, for renewable energy and has, you know, the, the chapter of environmental cooperation, etc. I guess the USMCA also plays against pricing carbon regionally because of integration of sectors and different tariffs, et cetera. So I'm not sure if, if a regional goal or a regional price could be set, but how, but, but you know, you talked about opportunities. I guess the opportunities are to use those institutions that are already working as, you know, as Mexico, as I, as I, I, I said before, the Mexican platform for the Mexico CO2 platform, the, mar the carbon market, has learned a lot from the California Quebec market. 
and we have an agreement with them. So maybe start, you know, with what we have. And in Canada, of course, you know, that would be kind of a problem because not even in the Canadian context, you can, you know, agree on a price. Each province has different mechanisms. So maybe to, to find a flexible institution, a flexible market, which you can, you know, um, be responsible as in a global area, but with very, very differentiated capabilities would be one of, one of the, the, the starters to, to set a carbon, a carbon price. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I would say three things. One is that, you know, Marcel is absolutely right. So provinces across Canada have very different approaches. BC has a straightforward carbon tax. Quebec has a cap and trade system. Um, there, are, there is a focus on the electricity sector in Atlantic provinces. Um, and the Western provinces, you know, the, the national tax applies in those jurisdictions that don't have their own um their own system in place so it really is a patchwork that's supposed to achieve a you know a minimum federal kind of price and i, I think that's debatable but i i agree i think regional subnational cooperation you build on what is there sectoral cooperation for the electricity sector where those grids are integrated anyway and and that stuff is working that is an option but honestly, I think Canada, the U.S. and Mexico should be in multilateral forums talking about how this is going to work and, and what the trade thing is. And I think that um, would be a good way to help the region iron out its own differences, right? It would pose a bunch of questions about integrated trade and where trade's not really integrated and how we start thinking about, you know, the green uh, surcharge on things. Great. And Andres, do you have anything to add to that or should we move ahead to the many other questions we have? Maybe move ahead and I, and I uh, contribute at some point. Okay, great. Um, so um, we got a question that actually is strikingly uh, similar to one of the questions that we were going to ask if we had time, and that is about prospects for bilateral coordination between Canada and Mexico, um, leaving <laughs> out the US. Uh, it's kind of serendipitous how this worked out. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? I have a hard time with this because um, when I so when I look at all of the things that I talked about, those clusters of cooperation, um, five or six years ago, I would have had a whole list of things that I thought that could could be a starting point for trilateral or or Canada, US or Canada, Mexico um, interactions. And, you know, let's be frank about this. So there there even was a Canada, Mexico environmental cooperation agreement. Uh, and at one point I had uh, a Canadian official uh, contacting me saying, we don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, we don't know what would be good avenues for cooperation. It's hard um, because the, their economies are so different um, and the geopolitical interests are, are not aligned. But um, the recent decisions, as Marcella clearly laid out, make it difficult to address the kinds of things we were talking about with, you know, green energy, clean tech, um, you know, electrification, um, you know, those kinds of things may be hard to have those discussions, but maybe not at the subnational level, right? And at one point we had, Ontario and Quebec politicians going down to Mexico to talk about renewables, right? Maybe that's the answer. Maybe we we don't try so hard at the national level, but we forge a network of connections that is in fact subnational and sectoral, you know, uh, in orientation. Great. Um, Marcella? Just a quick note. Um... I um, I agree with with Deborah. Uh, however, the well, I read the and some officials here in some Canadian officials in Mexico um, also um, talked about it. That there's a funding, there's a fund given by the Canadian federal government to the Mexican federal government to implement the NDC, the Mexican NDC, in terms of mm. even from infrastructure to research, right? 
And a lot of the money has gone to, uh, to research, not to infrastructure really, to research through universities, et cetera. And there are a lot of um, cooperation uh, with, uh, between provinces or the federal government with the universities, universities in Mexico. So um, I guess one of the avenues to cooperate is through universities. It's more like a transnational approach, right? Um, the second thing is uh, through cooperation projects, not, not from, um, from, from maybe from the federal government ex per se, but, for, but with this figure that we have in Mexico called interinstitutional agreements. Interinstitutional agreements are um, agreements that, that any, any agency of the Mexican government at any level can, or, or any government, state or local, can sign an, agree an agreement with a foreign partner without the Senate ratification. So through those uh, international agreements, you know, which are enforced like, like um, by international law, uh, Mexican agencies can, uh, can easily cooperate through these very technical projects of, uh, of climate change or uh, pushing forward with the renewable agenda. And uh, the, the second thing is that uh, provincial activity in Mexico, well, provincial Canadian provinces in Mexico are very active. Not all of them, of course, but the case of Quebec is impressive how they are funding and pushing forward the renewables and the carbon market experiences here in, in Mexico in the federal government and also in the states. Because in Mexico, by law, as Andres said, uh, the states and the municipalities need to have a, a climate action plan, which was you know, left behind some years ago. We didn't really work like much, uh, but you know, Provincial governments are in Canada, especially Quebec, and and some and in some way Manitoba in the hydroelectricity sector has been pushing forward the reactivation of these local climate action plans. So there are you know different avenues of cooperation, and again maybe not through the official channels, you know, federal with federal. But with other actors, with business, Canadian business in Mexico, we have Bombardier here in, in Querétaro, and we have a lot of very important business which are transiting to 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 a more uh, well, to a cleaner energy. So maybe with those other actors, it's easier to cooperate. Great. Um, so the next question is actually a Mexican focused question and I'd like to address it to both Marcela and Andres uh, to get both of your input on it. And that's a question about the role of NGOs in Mexican politics and policymaking at either the subnational or national level. Uh, and these could be domestic or foreign NGOs. Uh, but Marcela, from your point of view as an academic, um, how to what extent have they been you know major players and andres as your as a ngo representative um how influential do you feel you are and what are some ways that you might uh increase your influence well i i would you know leave the question to andres i would just say one thing from the because he's part of it right and, oh yeah of course. yeah so i would i would only say that from the academia we are having um we, we tend to have a, a very important connection with NGOs all the time. However, from academic studies and, and, and colleagues, uh, you know, chats and talks, is uh, that here in Mexico, NGOs, we perceive them as uh, not that strong, or, you know, we have a weak civil society still here in Mexico. And we have one or two or three NGOs that are uh, there are, you know, like uh, pulling the other ones, you know, to, to, towards uh, pushing forward a climate, a climate agenda. But these, uh, let's say these three or four NGOs, included Polea and others, are very related to academia, you know, because there's, if we go alone, the, acad the academia and the NGOs, we will not do anything. We, need, we, we tend to, to merge in 
in chats, in projects, in congresses, because we, we have, you know, either the academic weight or the NGO weight here in Mexican politics is not that developed still. So we tend to go together and hopefully we have, uh, we have achieved some things in the past, so maybe we can do it in the future. Um, thank you for the question, Rebecca. Yeah, if compared with the US and Canada, maybe we still need some work to do, but I think um, we have, as a sector, accomplished important things. One was the law. I think that was a, a result of NGO activism and, and coordination. I was involved there. And right now, it's, it's a difficult time for NGOs in Mexico because funding is not, you know, moving around, especially local funding. Government funding has been very demanding on, on, on us complying with a lot of things. And this is because, as a consequence, because there was some you, a, a not correct use of funding before for NGOs, you know? So in, in, in light of this, uh, there has been so much um, government overview of our, you know, complying with the law and, and fiscal situation, which is correct, but then that has uh, deterred some of us, some, some NGOs to, to move forward. But still, I think um, uh, this is a, a moment, and you know, NGOs tend to, to be more important, I think, personally, when, when government is not doing stuff. So uh, in climate change, I think our work is, is very relevant. You know, there's all sorts of NGOs, international NGOs with representation here in Mexico, like Greenpeace, WWF, and, um, EDF, and so on. We have the, you know, very legalist NGOs here in Mexico that are marching to uh, suing government because of uh, non-complying with the law that has very much in, in, in light of, you know, the, the previous NAFTA, now the, how you call it, the USMCA, the chapter 24, and the, the citizen, you know, these articles 14 and 15 before in the NAFTA were citizens petitions, I think was the name. And, uh, but it's, it's difficult, you know, for example, with the Tren Maya, no? This huge infrastructure project, which is uh, dividing public opinion. Some are totally in favor, some totally against. Basically those against are arguing the environmental impacts, but uh, the, 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 the head of government is, is, is you know, publicly uh, mentioning which NGOs are not the ones cooperating, which is not, I think that is not healthy because they are doing their work and, and they are, you know, put them in, in situation, even some with some dangerous things because then they can be, it's part of the business, no? But, but anyway, um, I think this is a, a moment where uh, maybe just an, as an academic and Deborah should know much more than, than I, uh, with this uh, USMCA, framework. We didn't have the same discussions that we had with NAFTA, no? where environment was so much uh, an issue for, for having or not the, the trade agreement. But I, I, I see some similarities and, and it's not that I, we want you to tell us what, what to do, but we need your support either by the university side, you know, the academia or the, the civil society. So because we are a region and, and, and what we do or don't affect us all. So um, I think this type of, uh, of events, the type of initiatives that you are promoting are very welcome and, and, and you just keep this, uh, uh, these things happening. And just in the other question you mentioned on bilateral between Canada and Mexico, we have been able to work with the Canadian embassy here in Mexico to precisely uh, uh, let more know to the general public about the, the, the new trade agreement and the new conditions and the new chapter 24 and how the CEC will work and who's the CEC, is this the same or not, you know, the Environmental Commission of North America. So I think there, there are things moving, but we need just to, to be more energetic about it. Okay. Thank you so much, Andre. So the final question for today is directed towards Deborah, and it has to do with the role of the Keystone Pipeline. 
and all of the drama there. And <laughs> I, it actually, I knew somebody was going to ask about Yeah, that. and it's actually a nice segue because our next NAC session is on the topic of, of pipelines. But what are your thoughts about how the U.S.-Canada relationship is being affected by all that? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a heretic and say not much. Okay, so you think it's it's not as consequential in terms no, of it, it it no, it's not that it is not consequential. It is absolutely consequential to large regions of this country. There is no question about that. Um, and it is part. It's it it for me. It feels like the last blow to an already ailing region, right? Um, at the same time, if again, what I said about the Canada-U.S. relationship holds, right? low key pragmatic let's get the job done let's focus on the things that we can do and and honestly the buy america provision i think for canadian policy policymakers that that is a sort of a more broad based broad based long term kind of you know how are we going to deal with that um but you know i don't want to minimize keystone but i also think that it's just clear it's going nowhere politically in the US, that's done. So, you know, understandably, I think federal politicians and even our ambassador kind of said, okay, well, we got to move on because, you know, nothing we do will change this. But Keystone is the, is the, the message, you know, we have to address that segment of the populations in the three countries that are transitioning and need serious, serious support. Well, thank you so much. And on that note, what a fascinating conversation this has been. I, I've learned so much and it's uh, it's really nice given the Amer uh, US centric nature of some of our earlier presentations to be able to talk so much about these three countries in together. And very much that will be the theme as we continue on with the colloquium. Our next session, which we hope you will join us for is on February 25th at 4 p.m. Uh, we'll be talking about pipelines. I wanna say a special thank you to uh, uh, professors Van Nijnenten, Lopez Vallejo, and Andres for joining us, as well as uh, my partner in all of this, Professor Barry Rabe and Allison Beattie for moderating. And uh, we'll sign off for now and wish everyone a great evening.